real world AI automation with AWS Lambda and AWS Bedrock featuring AWS Hero. That's a lot of AWSs. Ken Collins. Ken. <laughs> Let's get into real world AI automation with Lambda and Bedrock. Did you know that it's AWS Lambda and Amazon Bedrock are the official names? Right. And it's not a capital R, but Party Rock, I think, has a capital R. So but Party Rock has a capital R. Shout yeah. out to the namers at AWS who mm -hmm. consistently are inconsistent on all the things. Yes. I've got, uh, I want to set everybody's expectations and go, I'm not. Uh, uh, I don't have a degree in math or statistics. I'm a very down to earth sort of practical run of the mill AI person, right? So when I talk about real world, real world, I'm talking about things that I think everybody can do. Uh, I always like to, like if I can do it, you can do it because honestly, I'm like a lot of folks, I'm figuring stuff out for myself, you know, with just the tools that I got and, and the business problems at hand. So we're gonna be talking today about like real world, practical AI, run of the mill AI, what I like to call <laughs> unremarkable AI. We are going to post a link to your rags to riches articles, which I am currently using to learn about the things as well. Cool. But I've, I've been watching your AI evolution, your learning journey through this. And it's, it's been interesting from the, from the perimeter because eight, how long ago was it? Eight months ago, eight months ago, you, you started at zero. Well, I mean, you're still a developer, but you started at zero from the AI perspective. Mm -hmm. And and you have come a very long way in, in a very short amount of time. So yes. I'm, and you I'm, too can do this if you're obsessive about reading everything on YouTube and and uh, and Medium. Mm. But it's the most fun I've had uh, in software engineering in a long, long time. That's right, because because you said even an idiot like Chris can can do this, and I was I like, you know that. what? Challenge accepted. Real world a. AI, what does real world mean? So I wanna to try to level set folks on at least what I'm thinking about real world. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about business first. And I know we probably don't like to talk business, but I've been finding uh, a lot of my headspace lately is thinking about the business and solving problems for the business and the context of why work happens. So this is Cal Toe's, uh recommendation on how you could, how AI could change the game for your business. And they did this at the 2023 East meets West, and that's what EMW stands for. And there's a link down here and I'll publish this deck afterwards. If everybody wants to go to the links and we'll maybe include those in show notes, Chris, or something. Absolutely. Um, but they basically just uh, describe four cardinal points on how your company can adopt AI. So what we'll do here real quick is we'll go from uh, East, South, uh, West, and then North. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about these. So there's the, the East, which is the expand the product suite. So if you've never thought about AI and how it uh, can affect your company, let's use Canva as an example here. So Canva, like other companies, uh, Notion is a good example of this. They have all of their AI stuff wrapped up in something called Magic Studio. And if you're expanding your product suite with AI and it looks similar to what Canva is doing or maybe Notion, Notion, you have to do a lot of thinking around monetization strategies, price and packaging. Um, and if you've used Canva, you'll notice that a lot of this AI stuff is sort of sprinkled in across the user interface, right? It's going to do things like either help you rewrite copy, generate images from text, uh, summarization, just the good old fashioned stuff you would think of with AI. Uh, and it's kind of interesting too. The little stars are now like universally accepted, I think, as AI here. So you're, <laughs> yeah, right? Like it's, it's, you'll see this in Notion. Uh, you'll even see it in Copilot a little bit where they have like the little stars if you want to do a chat or um, I think Google Gemini came out, uh, you know, recently, a week or so ago, and Gemini has the the three stars as well. So we did it. We we turned an emoji into an entire industry. <laughs> Dash sprinkles. <laughs> Dash sprinkles. So the other one, let's go a little bit south. This is called the bit uh, the pivot the entire business, and this is a pretty interesting um, type of area. So there's the good company examples here are maybe like Databricks. Uh, they've turned their entire company into AI first, right? So they want to sell you like SageMaker style hosting or uh, data warehousing or orchestration tools or anything like pipelines. They've just basically said, you know, money's going to be dumped into AI. Uh, we want to be there and part of it. We want to do anything that you want to do with AI and sell you a whole bunch of solutions for it. Um, and that's a good example. Other examples might be like SAP. Um, SAP has made the decision that they're using AI from an internal perspective, right? So they've basically said, hey, we're retraining our staff to use AI. Uh, and in some cases, 
they're laying people off, right? Because now that AI is a tool that they can use internally, mm -hmm. um, they can basically deal with less headcount and stuff. Other companies like Upwork are in this category, right? They'll, um, it, it's funny from Upwork's perspective because it's not like, hey, we're using AI to do this and that. AI is their product, right? So they want to connect you with people that can do work like prompt engineers that can just kind of help you do basic stuff. And that's they're selling that as a skill. So pivoting your entire business doesn't have to look like Databricks. It could be, uh, you know, like SAP, like reorchestrate, like retooling your entire company. It could be like Upwork or it could be something else. Uh, Databricks has moved so far into this category that they're just holding now uh, Data AI Summit. So I wanted to give them a shout out here because uh, this one looked pretty interesting. It's also in person, I believe in, what is that, San Francisco? Yeah. So let's go to the West. A uh, good example of start fresh with new venture. I'm not sure if folks have seen this before, but it's a company called Jasper. Uh, they've basically come up with a knowledge management system, a project management system, much like maybe Jira. It also does sales and AI enablement. And basically the whole product from the ground up is just AI first. So everything about the customer experience, uh, everything that they're doing is just AI driven. And this is a great example of just like a new business that's starting up with AI. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, there's the North category. Like, and I think this is where a lot of people sit right there. They're working in companies like mine at Custom Inc. Uh, and they're looking for ways that AI can be a new tailwind for your existing business. So this is what I'm gonna share with y'all today. Uh, at Custom Inc, it kind of ends up all over the place, right? Like how can we enable AI? We have a design lab and we have lots of features where maybe we could sprinkle it on like, a, uh, like Canva does. Um, but at some point in time, I don't care where you work, if you're in this uh, existing business, somebody's going to come along and go, hey, AI is chat. Can we just add chat to the app? <laughs> right. Like, yeah, everybody. Um, I think Massimo was really good about this. He talked about like uh, how chat GPT has sort of poisoned all of our product people just to think that chat is the product. Right. And uh, bless their hearts. I think this is a good place to get started with AI. Um, but and, and we're certainly doing a little bit of this at Custom Inc. Um, but I want to talk about tailwinds for your business that are not, you know, what I call put a bird on it. And what I mean by put a bird on it is, is, uh, uh, chat is the bird and Portlandia is your company. <laughs> Anybody ever, right. So, um, we're not going to put a bird on it. We're going to do something a little bit more interesting. So, uh, Chris, you called out earlier about, uh, what this, uh, this blog article rag to riches and you said you're going through it. Yes. Cool. So one of the things when you're dealing with virtual assistants, right? You can think of, hey, I want people to chat with a, with my app. If you're dealing with a project where somebody's want a virtual assistant or chat, at the end of the day, you're going to need uh, what's called retrieval or knowledge uh, uh, augmentation with uh, with that AI chat model, right? Otherwise, it's just going to only be able to chat about what ChatGPT can talk about. So we're not going to talk about RAG. Uh, that's a whole separate talk. I could do a whole hour on RAG. And, but we're not going to do that. So what we are going to talk about is, is where your, your company can start. So once you have the sort of four cardinal points, right? Like, am I starting a new business with AI? So is that real world AI with a new business venture or an existing business venture? It's kind of hard to pick up on Gen AI and, and where you can apply it to the company. And I wanted to share this framework. It's called the WINS framework. Uh, this is by the Harvard Business Review. This article, I believe, if I look at the date there, what does it go back to September? And they published this out and it's pretty amazing, right? So let me talk a little bit about what the WINS framework is because I certainly use this in this real world stuff that I'm gonna show uh, a little bit later here. WIN stands for, we'll go on the right, words, images, numbers, and sounds. And these are things within your organization that people are doing that you can automate. So focus on these. Uh, so if we'll just go over these sort of briefly. The, uh, the one, uh, what they do here is, is they have on the bottom, you know, how much words, images, numbers, or sounds are, are being used in, uh, you know, what type of work that is. And that type of work would be like programming, finance, you know, finance deals with numbers, uh, images, uh, and words is, you know, that could be marketing copy and content, et cetera, and stuff. Uh, but they basically draw a correlation that within these sort of like, you know, there's a holding level in the crucible. Um, and like, like holding a lever is basically saying, hey, we can enhance productivity in non-digital fields. If it's in the crucible, they're saying, okay, you're hitting both points there on the high 
you should be doing stuff with AI in that. And they, they provide some examples in that article on which industries fit in these boxes and stuff. So for example, hmm. uh, in the balcony, right, would be like landscaping and other stuff, right? AI is not really going to change those industries. You don't really, they, they're just kind of watching the work from the balcony. Um, there's an acronym up there called SGNA. SGNA stands for Selling General and Administrative. They make call outs there. Um, that if uh, with sales work, right, if typical selling general and administrative work is uh, a high candidate uh, for ho- pulling a lever and using AI with that. Really? Okay. Makes sense. So what I'm going to show you today for real world AI, this is where I am in. We're in new tailwinds, customing for existing business. We're not shifting our whole business over to AI. Uh, we're going to use it for tailwinds. Those tailwinds could be things that I'm not talking about today, such as having your engineering department or finance or other maybe business analysts using AI a lot more, right? Whether it's code generation or just uh, rubber ducking business problems, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but we're going to talk about new tailwinds for the use, existing business. I'm on the winds upper left and the right. So if I kind of went back, I'm, the work that I've been doing here is in the upper left side and the lower right side. Uh, which is typical for me, right? I look for doing high value work that has big business impact uh, versus academic testing. So I'm doing wins holding lever. I'm leaning into the selling part of the SGNA uh, and I'm doing wins in the bottom right for next in line, which is a uh, digital front door and engagement. And a little bit of this stuff will make sense when I show some of the examples. So that's the boring stuff. That's the business side. Um, if you're an engineer like me, you use these business things, right? You um, you want to have impact for your work. So try to do a little bit of research, look inside of your company, look for things that maybe fall within the WINS framework if you're looking for opportunities on where to apply AI. Um, and I can definitely say that with some of the work that I've done, look for places where your company has possibly hired roles in the past uh, that might have been cut back on or where they never would have hired humans to begin with because it just wouldn't have worked at scale, right? They, you know, think of places where you might have used Mechanical Turk in the past or, or other types of business automation. And these will make really good candidates for, for applying AI in there. And this is going to be business, right? So what I'm going to share with you all today is not necessarily, it's not your problem, but I'm hopefully setting up a, the right context of how I've approached it from the business and where we put it, uh, some of these things that we worked at at Custom Inc. So I want to talk about agents, and this is a really fun word. It's kind of nebulous, um, but I, I wrote these little bullet points down, and they're going to mean different things to different people. But AI agents are kind of like digital assistants. They're similar to Siri or Alexa, but way more advanced. Uh, the analogy I like to talk about here is uh, if we all think back to our cars before CarPlay, right? And I've got a 2014 Ford, and when I get in it, right, I don't. And if, if I have to go somewhere, I have to go navigate. Uh, navigation destination point of interest, right? I have to go through a natural language processing system that is very rigid and structured and stuff, right? I can't just go, I want to go to McDonald's, right? I have to go through the system. But when CarPlay came around and we had the the natural language processing features of Siri, it just kind of changes the game. So when you look at the technological advancement of agents, think of that next jump, right? And that next jump is going to be very non-linear. You're going to be able to ask questions that at any point in context, uh, in way different ways and not through rigid uh, language systems and stuff, but it's just it's things are going to get way more advanced really soon here if they're not already. Uh, so agents typically use generative pre-trained models. This means models that you don't have to train. It's models that are like GPT-4, you know, Claude, et cetera. So these models can reason and act and do things. And the reasoning and acting, it's called React. It's an important part of how you use these models, right? So. A lot of people think of these models as sort of question and answering, but you can use them for logical decision making, categorization, control flows, all sorts of things. Um, So think of like you can ask them to plan out plans and then act on those plans and delegate those plans. So reasoning and acting. Uh, They can use data and tools. So just like humans, they can use web browsers. They could use uh, APIs and interfaces and make decisions. Um, They can pretty much do anything that we can. You just have to give them the opportunity to know what these tools are and when they might be appropriate to use in certain situations. This makes them perfect for complex automated or automating complex or routine uh, business tasks. Uh, because you're using generative pre-trained models, you're fast to market. You don't have to worry about um, augmenting with new data. You can just use retrieval to do that, which means you have no upfront investments in compute training or data science, right? Um, 
So when you bring RAG into this equation, that's really where you get the value out of and you're able to do things pretty fast. Um, you can fine tune models to work with your agents, but I want folks, at least in my opinion here, to think that's a break glass sort of situation. Fine tuning can help with things. Uh, a lot of people use the word fine tuning and when they say it, they don't really mean what they're saying. They're saying Kleenex and they mean tissue. Uh, I find a lot of times when people use the word fine tuning, what they really mean is what's called in context learning, right? So it's it's not fine tuning a model and training it. It's just getting better at asking it the right question. So it's again, it's very much like a human, right? Like if I asked you a question, you didn't understand me, that I might ask it again, or I might give you more context. And that's not fine tuning. That's called in context learning with large language models. So cognitive architectures There's a link down below to a blog article called uh, on Langchain, which is a very popular JavaScript and Python framework for talking to LLMs. And this article talks a little bit about the business play that OpenAI is making with what are called cognitive architectures and agents. I want you to know that this area is very nebulous. If you watch a lot of YouTube videos around AI, you might hear about like, hey, you can set up a whole company of autonomous agents and it will make decisions from the CEO downward to the marketing department. You can just watch the little bots run around and they're all autonomous and stuff. And these things are fun and neat. And there's some systems like, um, I forget which one is called, like if it's open GPT, where you can basically have your computer just being automated for you, you know, using language prompts and stuff. So again, there's a far future aspect of agents. Try not to get caught up into it, into the hype around it. So this diagram here talks about various decisions or where you might use AI in code. Um, and it gets pretty much down to like, are you using AI like an input and output? Or are you using AI to make a decision that it makes another decision to pass off to another AI agent? And I think a lot of times when you get into the hype of AI agents, you're going to be down at level six, right? But try not to go too far too deep and try not to think too much about the academic side of where we're going in the next one to two to three years. And in some cases, there's some doom. What is it called when people are like, sort of like, they look at AI and they, they just think, well, it's just going to kill us, right? <laughs> doom and doom. Uh, that's called a Chris Williams. That's called a Chris Williams, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, doomsayer. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So maybe, but like these are files that run on graphics cards, you're right? You got a long way to get there. So you don't have to worry about that now and try to ground yourself in the fact that you can do a lot with a little and you can still be using agents. It doesn't have to be fancy. So I'm we are three right seconds away from Skynet. There is a drone outside my window right now <laughs> with a laser beam pointed at me. No, I'm, uh, never mind. I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Your teleprompters come back to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, Elgato! <laughs> <laughs> So just to ground that fact a little bit, I don't know if folks are familiar with custom GPTs. It's a uh, product that uh, OpenAI came out with, I think on Dev Day uh, in December. Mm. And it basically gives you a way to take chat, chat GPT, uh, hook it up to some knowledge, right? You can upload documents that give it knowledge. Uh, you can also point it to various retrievals. You can say, hey, make an API call. Um, but it, it, it basically gives you a way through system prompts and other stuff to just to treat these as like miniature agents. And they even call this out in their documentation. They, these, these systems are often discussed as agents. So again, they could be very simple. They could be very complex. The complexity comes when you take the simple building blocks and you start putting many of them together to do lots of work for you. But it sounds, it sounds fancy and it sounds academic, uh, but at the end of the day, it's pretty easy. Let me give an example here. So I'll show you some of the real world examples that we're doing at Custom Inc. But I wanted to kind of ground folks in this concept that you don't have to do fancy, right? So in this case, I'm going to be talking about Lambda. And I'm going to be talking about Lambda that has code inside of it. And these Lambda functions are basically going to have some form of output, whether that output is an orchestration to call in another Lambda function from the output of an LLM call. Uh, if you've got a piece of code that is talking to a large language model and then outputting something, congratulations, you have an agent, right? It's that simple. <laughs> it's so simple, I made one. So that's how simple it is, folks. It is. And I think you can get fancy, right? This diagram shows the uh, what it would look like if, uh, I think this is the UML uh, symbol for like a decision state, right? So you can actually 
uh, you can say, hey, AI, I need to make a decision. Maybe it's a categorization within a decision tree, like based upon this content, what would you do with it? And then you could call another model or the same model with different system prompts. And then this stuff can go crazy, right? And you can pull a lot of these states into a single lambda, or you can break them up. But at the end of the day, you have an agent, right? And um, when you coordinate them together, it gets a little bit more complicated. But at the end of the day, it's pretty much just code inside of a lambda and you're making API calls. And we all know how to make API calls. It's pretty easy. The one thing I'd like to point out here when using Lambda, pick the cheapest one you can, right? Because most of your time is gonna be spent waiting for that large language model. Uh, in some cases, you could choose to stream that response back. But at the end of the time, end of the day, you're gonna be paying for a compute. And that's not where your cost is gonna be. Your cost is gonna be talking to these models, uh, not from the compute side, but you know, the, the, the Lambda stuff is going to be really cheap. Cool. Let's go to, all right. So let's talk about my real world AI uh, agent example. Let's get into the, the meat and potatoes of it. So I talked a little bit about the WINS framework, how we use the WINS framework to identify where there's potential at custom ink for applying AI. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how I tried to do ethical AI, where rather than taking a look at maybe 15 uh, anchors that had jobs and go, oh, let me automate those away. I decided to use AI uh, on something that hadn't been done before or a problem that we would have never thought of applying humans to because it just would have taken too many resources, which mm -hmm. I thought was uh, ethical of me, but also at the same time, right? Like, I think we should be real. Uh, I don't know if you're like me, Chris, uh, 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 Cyber Sith. <laughs> Do you guys watch like How's It Made? Oh yeah, all the time. Yeah, so if you watch the older episodes of How's It Made, you're almost always gonna be watching somebody that doesn't have a job now, right? Cause you'll see somebody like moving something from part A to part B or machine A. And mm -hmm. at, at some point that job will be automated. There'll be a robot that grabs it and moves it from, you know, from, from, from assembly line A to assembly line B or the, you know, the business may have grown. So automation, is going to be thematic all the time. And I want to be honest, right? Like uh, whenever I talk to my business peers and other folks about automating jobs, even ones that are possibly replacing human jobs, I'm excited about the technology, but I'm also want to be um, thoughtful in how AI is applied, right? Yeah, of course. So, uh, but you know, I, th I found opportunity uh, through the WINS framework in applying uh, uh, AI to a process that hadn't been done before at Custom Inc. And this is what it looks like really high up. So at Custom Inc, we have a design lab. And what I did was, is I took the opportunity, well, let me describe a little bit about the problem that we're solving. So Custom Inc, we do, it's a pretty big company. Uh, we've got a lot of people using our design lab. Uh, they could be individuals. They could be part of friends or family generating designs for maybe anything from bereavement, you know, celebrating somebody's life to uh, just fun stuff or parties, uh, to businesses that need uniforms, uh, to, education, you know, for other uniforms and just any type of things. We have a lot, hundreds of business segments that we uh, cater to and some we want to be better at than others. One of the things that we've never had insight into is what customers are doing in our design lab, because it's not feasible to pay humans to go look at every design and either classify it or, you know, and, and align it with uh, maybe our business strategy uh, or even do personalized marketing with it because it's just too big of a problem. So I looked at this and I felt like one of the things that I really wanted to learn was how to write small agents, how to get this type of work done, right? Because I had all this documentation at the company on like how we might do order analysis and stuff. So I had all this material that I could just feed, uh, again, in prompt learning to AI to do this particular job and how to classify things. So I came up with this pretty neat framework uh, and it's pretty much what you see here, and I'm going to drill down a little bit closer to it, but from a high level, uh, sort of, and that's what the balloon is for perspective, as customers save designs in our lab, what we do is we have AI generating content based upon those designs. And then we use AI reasoning and actions and additional pipelines off of that knowledge pipeline uh, to do cool business stuff. <laughs> so let's zoom in a little bit of what that looks like. And this is small and don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah, yeah, with a little Heidi Klum one. There uh, we go. Oh, neat. Love it. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll zoom this up. But at the, at the, 
at a high level, uh, we have these basically, you know, there's an event driven system on the left hand side, there's a knowledge agent in the middle, and then we do these sort of value propositions or what I call through vertical AI solutions on the right hand side. So let's zoom in a little bit. So it's a good old fashioned event driven architecture. Uh, we're using, uh, we have a various back end here. This one is particularly, I think, Ruby on Rails. If you didn't know, Custom Inc. Uh, was probably one of the first companies along with GitHub that was using Rails uh, in production. Uh, and uh, we've been using EventBridge a lot with Lambda and even Kubernetes uh, to move all of our older AMQP stuff into a modern event bus. So it's pretty easy. We're already publishing events when designs are created or updated. And what I've done here is that I piped all those events into EventBridge and I'm listening for them with a, a Lambda function that puts those events into an SQS queue. This particular SQS queue is using, it's a FIFO with deduplication. Uh, that's a little bit of a cost savings that gives us about 15% cost savings. And what that does is, is as customers are updating or saving the designs, that might be changing quote quantities or pricing, right? So this just kind of gives us a little bit of a, uh, a, a gated flow so that we can sort of run deduplication because uh, running AI across hundreds of thousands of designs a month is costly and every little bit that you can uh, do save in this SQSQ here. So further off onto the right, we've got uh, a knowledge agent. This knowledge agent has one responsibility and it's to generate textual content that like if you were to look at this design, like a human were to look at this design, how would you describe it? So we're doing two things with Amazon here, uh, the little volcano in the upper, at the top there, that's a model called Lava. It's a vision model. Uh, one thing I want you to take away from this talk today is that vision models are going to change everything, right? So we're all used to typing in text into ChatGPT. Uh, and you may have used ChatGPT where you upload a photo and you have it describe it or, or something like that. That's with a, a model called GPT-4V, which is a vision variant of GPT-4. Lava is a vision variant that's built with Llama. And these things are wild. The, 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 the amount of work that you can unlock with these vision models are just going to be insane and they're going to get better and better and better. Uh, Google Gemini uh, Pro just released their vision model, uh, which I haven't evaluated yet. Uh, but Lava was kind of first to market back in 2023 uh, from some kids at uh, the University of Cambridge. So what we do with this knowledge agent is we go through and we look at each of the designs uh, views. So the design could be on the front, could be on the back, it could be on the left sleeve here, like I have mine. And we look at all of these individual views and we have uh, AI and an older ML model. So at the top there, there's something called Amazon recognition. If you've not used it, it's a uh, sort of, I call it an old school. And I, I know some of my peers hate this, right? It, like it's very modern <laughs> until a year ago, but all of a sudden it's like, I'm just like calling the legacy ML stuff. And how the mighty have fallen. Wow. <laughs> And, you know, recognition is OK. It can't recognize a lot of the stylized text, but we supplement that. So for every view, we have recognition reading the text to do the best it can. Um, Lava is very finicky for the way that you can instruct and prompt engineer it. I can't really ask it to read all the text and describe all the visual elements and come up with a possible use case all in one prompt. So you have to do these th things three times back and forth. And then what I do is I use uh, uh, Anthropic uh, Claude instant model, which is a lighter weight version of Claude. And I ask it to take all three of those descriptions and summarize it. And there's an example up here at the top where uh, recognition is now the little engine that could, yeah. So I have a little, uh, an example here at the top. And you can see here, I, I tried to be truth here in this advertising. You can see that the the text at recognition doesn't understand everything, right? It doesn't see Western branch because it's it sees branch, but it got it wrong. And it doesn't see Western because again, these are, OCR models that were made by Amazon that were, I think, primarily used maybe for financial banking statements and other stuff. It wants to see things on on clean lines versus sort of uh, graphic T-shirts, but that's mm. OK. We have uh, vision models that are based on large language models, which can do amazing things. Uh, so that text description, the vision description there that talks about Western Branch High School, that's the output of that process. So I'll pause there and maybe ask some questions and I'll get a little bit to the right on how we use that data. I, I'm just curious. Um, I, I know you're not really presenting anything on security per se, but how do you actually implement any kind of best practices around this? Right? You know, particularly like, for instance, you mentioned you're using FIFO to kind of reduce some, some of the latency and optimize yeah. costs there. But uh, what other practices are you putting in place for the security? 
Well, that would be the same. Like, so that's a, it's a deep topic. So mm -hmm. I could give you some examples, right? Like, so custom ink implements GDPR and the right to be forgotten. And we take that seriously, right? That a customer's data should be a customer's data. Mm -hmm. So the, the same type of security is just going to fit in there naturally, right? So like, uh, let's say you implement some of your rights to be forgotten and we go through and delete your account and delete and empty out uh, all your designs in a way that's compliant with the law. Uh, because it's an event-based system, it'll just all naturally flow. Like these things will just naturally reprocess and your, and your information will be deleted. The authentic authorization, right? So the auth in aspect of it, it's gonna look like any other web app, right? So if we hook this up to say a GPT front end or a virtual assistant, and let's say that virtual assistant is geared towards post sales or maybe reordering. And let's say you ask the virtual assistant, hey, I'm interested in reordering my Western Branch Senior shirt that I uh, ordered last year. Can you help me with that? Well, the knowledge retrieval system that makes the API calls is going to, just going to do authentication just like any other app, right? We're going to understand who the current user is. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to reach into the database and do a semantic search for you across your designs only, right? So uh, just because we have a database that has all the designs in it, and now a semantic database that understands what those designs are, those are yours, right? And, and the same access controls that apply for using a web app are the same access controls that'll apply for accessing this data. That's awesome. Now, um, I'm, I'm also curious, how do you prevent individuals from um, putting, you know, inappropriate comments or inappropriate items, you know, on a shirt or whatnot? How do you, how do you prevent that? You don't. But there's a way that you can deal with it with AI that's critical. And mm -hmm. so uh, depending on uh, this may select, this may come into your decision choices for how which model you implement. Certain models implement more access control features. Um, like, you know, they, they won't do face detection. There's, there's, Claude has a lot of them too, right? And, and custom GPT has a lot of privacy and practices in, in place. But so imagine um, one of the things, I'll show you a mistake that I made. So when I, uh, get to the other end of the AI pipelines, I'll talk about a segmentation agent. And one of the things, and and they talked about this at reInvent, if you're using Claude and you're using it for classification, this is true for any model, give it the ability to say, I don't know. So I found, I looked at my CloudWatch metrics and I was like, I'm not hitting the percentages of API invokes to Claude API calls. I can tell that my Lambda was trying over and over again to classify things or do things. And when I went and looked at some of the designs, the first one I looked at was just the F word. That was it. It was just the F word on the shirt. Nothing more, right? And that's what we get. We get some, I'm sure there's like, you know, people are creating content that's their right to do so and, and we're helping them do that. But one of the things I did with uh, with the, the agents here is I gave them the ability to opt out, right? So rather than if it couldn't classify things or it couldn't do the work because it maybe just couldn't understand, you know, the vulgarness or or you even set it up in the, in the, the prompt engineer that's like, hey, I don't want to, you know, classify shirts that are just, uh, you know, that have foul language, right? So you give it an, an option to bail out on that stuff. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, though. Actually, it does. Okay. It, it, it answered it. Um, segue, but you know, it's a great question. That's a Claude can't do it, but Jean Claude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So from uh, j just so that I can level set the the not the level of effort of what this is doing, but from a, from a build team internally at Custom Inc. How many people did it take to assemble this process? It took me eight weeks, start to stop. You personally just can nobody else. That's right. Good to know. Okay, cool. Wow. That's, uh, that is uh, impressive. All right. I appreciate that. <laughs> but remember though, that's the inner loop work, right? So there's a lot of outer loop work on, you know, doing maybe some prototypes, mm. uh, kind of like how you would do small sketches if you're trying to do an animation or something like that, or a storybook. Um, sure. So there's a lot of outer loop work, but the inner loop work, pretty quick, right? It's just a couple Lambda functions and making some API calls and then, you know, shipping it early, shipping it off and watching the system, you know, making, you know, making things like $5,000 mistakes and go, oh, I've wasted $5,000 these past few days because I didn't let it opt out sort of thing, <laughs> right? Yeah, gotcha. yeah. It's always learning.
This you see, and, and, and I was actually curious about that. If you actually like sit down and brainstorm with you know other individuals and other group departments, and you know storyboard the whole thing, and before you even get to the part where you start, okay, you know what, I'm this is what I'm envisioning and how I'm going to go about it. Yeah, I did a lot of that out of loop work, you know, and I even worked with a lot of uh, business partners at Custom Inc on where we thought we can get value out of this, uh, these sort of AI agents further downstream and had all that lined up in alignment even before I, I, I set code. Down. I try not to waterfall things, right? But like, I saw all this stuff in my head, right? Like, it's really easy for me to think of this stuff. It's really hard. It's harder to implement it. Uh, but then again, it doesn't take a long time. It, and I try to teach people about this when they're adopting AI. They're like, well, we need prompt engineers, right? And if you need a prompt engineer, what you're really saying is you need an engineer that has the ability to think about products. What you need is a product engineer, right? Mm -hmm. Or you need an engineer that's working closely with someone from the business that can articulate the business problems. Because when you're dealing with language models, you're essentially, your outputs are gauged by how well you can describe the problem. And if you're, if you're dealing with an engineer that just simply can't describe the problem well, or they don't know the context around the business for it to do the work, then then you're not going to get the outputs that you need so there's a there's behind the scenes work here on, on why i was well suited to do this particular type of work it's because i'm really sort of dialed into the business um and i have good partnerships that that i can lean on to talk about the business problems and then i can just translate those into the natural language or event-driven systems hmm. so i'll do a real quick tour a little talk about the what happens after the knowledge agent. So this is an open search database. If you have not used this before, uh, open search is the modern equivalent of Elasticsearch. So there was that whole fun thing that happened about a year or so ago where they were like, hey, we want to be better on our licensing. And then everybody's like, well, we'll just go ahead and uh, change, right? So open search was born. Fun fact, uh, my background at Custom Inc., one of the first things I did was I implemented Elasticsearch an organizational search across a lot of our knowledge, right? So whether those be sales comms or our internal CRM tool. Uh, and then I even did a lot of elastic search work on our product catalog uh, based upon Baymer usability reports and stuff. So I am a faceted search junkie. And I will say, if you are an AI, if you want to get an AI, and if you've ever done anything with elastic search and you like search, you're going to love AI and you're going to love semantic search because all the skills that you learned and how to work with elastic search are all there, right? It's an art form on how well you design your indexes. The only thing that's changing with AI is that you're going to be using semantic search or what's called KNN, uh, uh, nearest neighbor search versus a tokenization strategy. But um, yeah, so if you're a search person and if you've done search, whether it be for product stuff or internal tooling uh, and, you, and you're and you getting into AI and RAG and retrieval, you're going to be, you're going to be well suited to solve some really cool problems. Hmm. So this, in this case, we just have an open search database. It has static properties about the design. That could be things like, does it include like Boolean attributes? Does it have a design on the front or the left sleeve or the back? Uh, the semantic search gives you the content, the search for stuff, right? So uh, we talked about like how a virtual assistant could help me find my soccer shirt or my Western branch shirt later on through a retrieval system. And we put all that in a nice little elastic search uh, or open search database uh, that allows us to do KNN uh, vector searches. And again, one of the static properties would be like a, an account ID or something like that. And that's how you bring your traditional web application, you know, author is, what is it? It's auth in and auth Z. So the authentic authorization, right? The read certain rows and stuff. What we do with that is I've got AI agents that I stack up on the right-hand side. Uh, we've got a segmentation agent that goes through and classifies things. Uh, we're using Claude there and a whole bunch of our documentation. I'm not going to really get into what, uh, maybe for a later talk, I can really drill down and how you can prompt engineer uh, Claude to do some amazing things. Uh, mm -hmm. The one that we're using here is Claude 2.1, which is an amazing 200,000K context window, which means you could literally put hundreds and hundreds of pages of documentation or process or decision making and, and it can solve these large problems for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we do is we memoize the outputs of that and we put that back in, again into the open search database so that we can use that. And then what we've been exploring here, what I call these vertical AI solutions where parts of the business that would need to know about this data set, you know, like how well to market to people or, or it could be sales or lead scoring or it could be, um, um, retrieval systems for customers and virtual assistants. But in this case, one of the things that we uh, did early on 
uh, I call this a, a pay-go strategy, is, is that we know we want to do things like hook this uh, data set up so that it can help customers find their designs easier or work with them from a, a pre or post sales aspect. But we also want to make sure that when we're talking to the customer, we know who we're talking to and why we're talking to them, right? So if they're getting emails from us, um, we now know what's in their, uh, what are their designs are. And when we email them about like, hey, do you want to reorder your product? The email team now here through what is called our content management system agent can look at that content and make decisions and even write copy. And we can put those into things like Salesforce or other, um, what are called uh, um, ESPs, email service providers like Clavio and stuff. And it just, again, this, this thing gives me sort of tingles, right? But we're able to do all this work with AI and all these pipelines are just little Lambda functions. Um, in fact, they're all in the same repo. It's a, it's a, it's a mono repo and it's just a bunch of SQS queues. Um, I don't know if you saw that in the upper left-hand side, everyone has an SQS queue in front of it. I like to say, if you yeah. love your event-driven architecture, put a queue on it, right? Because uh, <laughs> otherwise you're gonna have a bad day. So always build your event-driven architectures with SQS queues in front of your Lambda. You're just gonna, you're gonna love it more. It allows you to be a little bit nimble. So for example, let's say you, within your code base, you come up with a better way uh, to write the marketing assistant content for the CMS agent. Right, because it's hooked up to an event queue and it Plinko chips all the way down, you can start that work off again. Right, you can go back into the database, get a you know hundred thousand designs and just drive them into this Lambda function, and you'll get massive scaling uh, and the capability to, to rerun any of these units of work. So that's it, and uh, we can talk a little bit about some. Uh, uh, I've got some deltas, uh, some positives, and some deltas, and maybe some questions to talk about. But uh, the ones that I wanted to share high level. Bedrock is simple, right? It offers uh, a handful of foundation models that are amazing. And one of the cool things why I think folks like OpenAI and making API calls and building little chatbots is because they have an amazing API. And there's like start to finish an engineer playing with a large language model is just an API call away. And Bedrock mm -hmm. makes that super easy, right? You just accept the end licensing terms, you stand it up, and now all of a sudden from anywhere in your... Uh, AWS account, you're going to be able to talk to these really powerful foundation models and it's pay go, it's serverless billing, right? You're only going to pay for what you use. And that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, anthropic cloud models are, they're amazing. I did not think uh, they're a little rough around the edges. You have to learn the prompt engineering structure. And when I share this deck out, the link at the bottom here is what's linked up to the uh, bedrock prompt engineering guide. Uh, the anthropic folks have done an amazing job at specifically coming up with a prompt engine engineering guide that's for bedrock so they have great documentation if you're using anthropic from uh, an anthropic api uh, but from in bedrock it's a first class citizen it's the exact same model uh, but they do have a, a prompt engineering guide that walks you through how to do that and it's really good uh wrapped a uh, delta so wrapped api access lacks new tools and system prompts so if you follow the news uh, Anthropic has a new capability to where they're building in uh, the aspect of function calling. And that is, is the ability to give your agents the decision to use certain tools. And so for like a segmentation thing, that might be a Google search, right? So if it wanted to understand the design a little bit more, it might need to look at some of the URLs that are in the design. And again, this is what humans would do. And you would need to give it a tool. And the way that you do that now with Claude is you have to do a lot of prompt engineering and a lot of DIY function calling with inside of the prompt itself. But if you've ever mm -hmm. dealt with open APIs API, they have a top level API that's called tools or functions that allow for tools to be used. Bedrock wraps those APIs, so you don't really have direct access to them. Likewise, Bedrock doesn't give you access to the tokens that you use in a particular request. So the only way you can look at how many tokens you use and how much you're going to be billed is to look at CloudWatch metrics. That makes things hard. So imagine you're a single developer in a single AWS account. You don't have a staging account or a development account or a production account. You're not going to find an easy way to find out how much, like if you want to optimize your prompt and reduce the token usage and the cost, right? you have to run the code and then wait about three minutes and then go look in CloudWatch and try to do some math. And if CloudWatch is taking production traffic or staging traffic, you're going to have to do more math and more guessing. Uh, and that's right. not fun. Mm. Um, I've is recently that learned- to, Is that what happened to you? Yeah, yeah. Well, we have uh, at, at Custom Inc. We have uh, dev accounts and we have staging. Account. We're a multi-stage uh, AWS setup, so like 
Okay. Uh, we have you know one master account and then organizational units and different AWS accounts. So that's what I had to do. I actually had to go back, had to run a local test suite, you know, that did maybe a hundred uh, units of work or a thousand, you know, then go back, then wait a few minutes, you know, kind of hit refresh in the console and go do some math. You know, I'd set up a CloudWatch dashboard and that gave me my feedback loop that I needed on how to optimize the system. Mm-hmm. Would have been a lot easier if they just had the response, count the tokens. That's what OpenAI does. So, yeah. um, right. There's also this concept of um, I talked a little bit about Lava, and we're using Lava now on a SageMaker inference endpoint. So you kind of have to get this really big 10 gigabyte model. You got to put it in an S3 bucket, and then you get basically uh, SageMaker, uh, which is basically like an EC2 instance, but they're running GPUs. And when you want to switch from say SageMaker to say token usage, or let's say you want, let's say you're doing so much usage of say Claude, there's a limit to how much your AWS account can hit that, right? I think it's uh, uh, two million or a million tokens a minute. And believe it or not, if you're doing large amounts of work, you can hit that pretty quickly. And guess what? There's no way with AWS to ask for more, right? There's no way to increase the quota. Like the easiest way for you to, like it's just a hard cap at the account level. So what you can do is you can provision, use like sort of pre-provisioned, almost like a, a, what are they called? Like the RI, like a reserved instances. And you could basically say, hey, I need reserved instances, but it's going to be really hard for you to take your token usage and go, let me stand up servers that pre-provisioned and do the math for that stuff. And in fact, I did some of the math and it would be easier for me to set up four additional AWS accounts because the gap between the cats yelling at me hey sweetheart um <laughs> Kitty. the uh the the token based billing i would have to use almost four aws accounts worth of the token based billing before it even made sense to go to the provision stuff so the, there's a lot of mm-hmm. you know air gap in that pricing model mm-hmm. um and then i think uh i think folks might have questions around value or not in bedrock's agents like i'm just using a lambda here but there is something in bedrock called agents and there is something called knowledge products which gets a little bit into the product side of how bedrock is trying to do a little bit more what open ai is doing hmm. i don't like it i don't think it gives me any value i just rather stand up a lambda uh and put some code inside of it than than than, than click the console in a few places and try to act like AWS is going to be a, a GUI tool like some other places. So I've not used bedrock agents. I've not used bedrock knowledge products. It just doesn't make sense for me. And then uh, I think the biggest lesson that I learned is that when you get into projects that are maybe doing classification or using AI, you're going to pick up a new skill as an engineer. You're going to learn to do what I call, uh, what are probably just normal for maybe ML engineers or data practitioners. And it's just data set driven development. Uh, right, just get a data set, and it's like it's not a web app anymore. I'm really just taking a data set that I'm using as a gold standard, and then I'm prompt engineering, and then I'm comparing two numbers. How well did I do? Did I get to eighty percent? Did I get to eighty-five? Um, mm-hmm. You know, if I if I find like a few instances where I'm not getting the outputs I want from AI, I can put in either more in-context learning, or I could provide examples, or or even add in heuristics and stuff like that. So. Mm-hmm. That to me was really exciting. I actually had a really good time with that. I, I like, uh, that's something I not, never got into, but it was really fun. I liked it. So when when you say data set, what, were, what was the data set that you were working with for this? Basically what I had done was, was taken about 3000 designs that had been segmented by our human team as mm-hmm. orders come into the system. And I used that as my gold standard when I was doing segmentation uh, that, that was that AI. was your measure against model. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it, I thought that was pretty cool though, because what it meant was is the stuff on the right ended up being the ruler for how good the stuff in the middle was. Right. So yeah. and because this whole system flows in one direction, uh, let's say I wanted to change out the vision model from lava to GPT four, right? And that mm-hmm. and it becomes better. Then the expectation is is that everything on the right just automatically gets better by that right it just sort of raises the tide for everything um and so it's really fun when the system it's all inside of a single repo it's broken up into individual functions you know at the end of the day uh in different entry points but um it is it does act as one cohesive system and i think that's the the other thing i, I think i would really like folks to take away from it when i originally architected this thing out the thing i really wanted was on the bottom right um, but I built this architecture in such a way that that 
I build the knowledge first and then the knowledge can be referenced later on by AI after the fact. So like if you if you find yourself in a similar situation, I would highly recommend not putting all the code into one thing to get to the thing that you really want. Try to break out the knowledge as a, as a dis distinct set of work and build that right. knowledge up in its own database and then have things that work with that knowledge outside of it. Nice. Mm. hear what you're made of <laughs> well that brings me to a, a really good question then for, for anyone looking to be more proficient at you know either with aws bedrock or or ai automation um any other resources outside of the ones that we already are going to provide to our you know uh viewers um courses recommendations as far as even certifications what are your thoughts hmm Okay, there's a lot. Let's start in reverse. So certifications. Mm -hmm. I think stuff is moving still so fast with AI that it's uh, it's like a, a, a junior engineer wanting to optimize the first bit of code, right? Because they, uh, it's got a scale or something like that. Do not prematurely optimize. I, I, I started my engineering career uh, with a friend of mine named Mark Embriaco, who now works at EA Games. And he, the thing he distilled to me while I was learning to program you know, in my mid thirties was just don't prematurely optimize, don't prematurely optimize. And I see this with businesses with AI, they want to, you know, their knee jerk reaction is maybe to build platforms or wrappers around things or, um, you know, once you see one thing, then they'll start pattern recognition on, okay, we need a pattern for this, right? Like, so like if your company maybe starts out with AI summarization, uh, or a very, very common thing to start using AI in, uh, maybe in an internal tool, Right, you can do summarization to help maybe salespeople understand where you know through a complex series of maybe communications with a customer where they might need to do action items or follow up items, right? Mm -hmm. And then once, or maybe you could do summarization and product reviews and other stuff. And then once everybody sees this, they start. Um, I forget what the 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 word is that where we see faces, right? They want to start pattern recognizing. And go, okay, well let's. Uh, if they see semantic search, they're like, well, we got to semantic search all the things, right? We got to go out in the, every database and now we need to add KNN search for it, right? Or now we need to summarize everything and try to resist that urge uh, to optimize or build patterns around things. And even uh, that even goes so far as uh, certifications and stuff like that, right? Um, all the stuff that I do is just what kids on, you know, what I call kids. I'm like 51 now, right? But it's mm -hmm. just what kids on YouTube are talking about, right? It's not hard, <laughs> right? So... Um, it's hard for me to imagine as fancy as a, as a business value kids these days, um, uh, is it's like, I don't, I don't think the, the certification is there. So my recommendation is to be curious, be curious. uh, go watch a lot of, uh, YouTube videos. Uh, like I, I watched Matt vid pro on YouTube, a uh, great guy. I'll, I'll try to I'll include that link too. Um, uh, but the way I've always learned is to take a problem and just go do it and uh, mm. your problem is going to look different than mine. Um, and at the end of the day, there's just going to be API calls and how you stitch those API calls together to get some sort of business output. Um, so watch you. Oh yeah, there it goes. Matt Fit Pro. Yeah. Um, so watch you to, uh, go find, I think what I'll do, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take a, a list of things that I recommend just watching for AI. And these are newsletters. These are, um, lists that I'm on and anything. And I'll just share them with y'all. And I'll just watch these religiously. So like half of my day is just, uh, <laughs> just for the just, not for the not um, very well versed in even the beginnings of AI. MIT has a Python for AI. Well, it, it's it's a is it Python for AI or AI for Python? It, it's it's a beginner artificial intelligence course that's taught right after their CS50 Python course. Mm -hmm. um, that is excellent. Uh, cool. It actually walks you through the beginnings of how and the why and the, and the mathematics behind AI from from an from an MIT uh, teacher. Uh, it's um, I'm I'm currently in the process of watching it right now and I'm getting a lot out of it. So I'll put that in the show notes as well. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I did in this, Chris, was uh, I've only dealt with AI with JavaScript too. So like, there's some Ruby wrappers. You know, I am known for a lot of my Ruby work and Rails work uh, with the AWS stuff that I've done. But I've been using just JavaScript lately, and it's just so fun. Like Langchain.js, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm using in all of this work. It's uh, I'm even finding that the better I get with it, the, the less frameworks I need. So I'm even questioning 
you know, the resources that are out there that everybody's using, like, oh, you got to use Langchain because, and the more that happens with AI, the more I realize that these tools that we're sort of assuming that we need, like, uh, so I'll give you an example. Langchain has this concept of memory management and it wraps mm -hmm. up inside of it uh, because the context window can only be so big and the context window is the amount of K, like, you know, 32K context window, 100K context. And, right. and if you fill that context window up, you're just going to break. It doesn't work. So what happens is, is if you have a conversation with ChatGPT and it's really, really long, the middle of it's kind of condensed down for you. They're doing the memory management for you. And the Python Langchain JS stuff or the Python Langchain SDKs have really good memory management and their agents and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's going to go away for us, right? It's going to be managed. It's going to be as Simon Wardle says, it'll be below the waterline. So the new assistance API with OpenAI <clears throat> removes the memory management feature completely, right? You don't have to worry about it because they're going to manage it on their side. They will automatically take the messages within the thread and condense mm -hmm. them down as needed. And you don't even need to store the messages client side or server side anymore. They're going to, that'll be below the waterline. So um, be mindful that wherever you start picking up with your AI journey, if you go mm -hmm. too far back months, you're going to be maybe doing like I did when I was first learning to program, where I literally spent two months trying to learn about fifth level DB normalization. Never needed it, right? Never. <laughs> so um, move fast, find something that you want to do, uh, move quickly, get it done because things are going to change really quickly after that. But like you said, Chris, you will need some base. The base knowledge will help you out a lot. And I, and I like this. I love your statement about being curious. Um, uh, I actually sent uh, Chris a link for the Bedrock, um, AWS Bedrock uh, resources. Mm -hmm. And in there, there's actually some uh, hands on workshops, right? And it's a good way to just get yourself, you know, involved and engaged in, in this technology, right? So, where, where, is it? where is it? I don't see it. Uh, I sent it to you privately, sir. Private? Because apparently I can't. Uh, Discord? It. Slack? Uh, here, in stream. Oh, oh, in StreamYard. Yeah. Derp. Well, I'll post this one in chat, though. There's a thing called Party Rock. And one of the things the comment has failed to post to V Roundback. Well, maybe you can do it, Chris. <laughs> yeah. hey, that's that's the same error I got, too. Uh, I, I don't know why I got that. Where are you putting these comments? Well, I'm logged into YouTube, so it's. No, no, no. I, I, uh, okay, Ken, send me the link in Slack. Roger, send me your link in Discord because I don't see Roger's stuff. Yeah. And Ken, you're not allowed to post links. Um, it's a, it's a streamer thing. <laughs> I get it. I get it. It's secure because <laughs> they don't they don't trust you. Well, Party Rock. Having... Well, so Party Rock. One of the things we did with them, uh, we did this at Custom Inc. too. Party Rock was used by AWS internally to help sort of their product people understand what these things can do. It's just it's very basic, but once you build an app with Party Rock, you start to do this thing where you connect with, well, an LLM isn't just a single input and output. It could be a sequence of things. And you can stitch these things together with Party Rock. And I find that if you're starting out with AI, start off with Party Rock and build something just silly, right? Just yes. play with it. And I guarantee that Party Rock will help connect you with the thinking of using these foundational models in a way that you can sort of stitch together and it, it, you're just playing there, right? You're not going to really, you can make sort of neat production things with party rock, but you'll get this experience of what it's like to stitch this stuff together. And then you'll end up with an understanding that it's like, Oh, I could just make little Lambda functions and, you know, and deploy these things and stuff like that. But the, there's a lot of models out there too. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the cool things that we're going to do are going to stitch a whole bunch of them together. So, Literally, in the work that I just showed you, right? It's three models. It's Lava, it's Cloud 2.1, and it's Cloud Instant. And we're using different ones at different points because they're better at it. And it also gives us a modularity that we can switch out later on. We can go, okay, but there's innovation here with Gemini Pro and Vision. Let's switch to that or other things and stuff. So it's so fun. It is. It is. And Roger, did you want to talk about those bedrock resources? Uh, no, I just mentioned them already. Um, if you scroll through through the list, you'll you'll see that there's an Amazon Bedrock workshop and uh, documentation, as well as tutorials on you know prompt engineering, as well as building out generative AI applications uh, using um, Bedrock. So nice, good resources to have. Yep. Prompt engineering is a good one too, because it's it's easy to again prematurely optimize and think like, hey, let's build tools 
where the the prompt can be abstracted and maybe you can have a product person edit the prompt mm -hmm. but the more that you the better that you get with ai and the better that you get with these agents you're going to find that the prompt is really coupled to the version of code that you need to ship at the time and it's not something that can be abstracted out and you can't even use a prompt from one system with another system right like it basically can but the prompt if, if you're really maximizing your output of these models you have to mm -hmm. understand the model and its nuances and the prompt has to go along with it so like again like how i showed how lava right that i i couldn't get it to think too much right it just slowed it down it would crash right so i kind of had to piecemeal it back and forth right i had to ask it three different times to get the complete answer that i needed mm -hmm. and you just learn this sort of stuff and again i just i fight abstraction a lot right like i i think i, I just think people like to build uh they see something once and they try to build tools on top of it. And I think AI is just going to be moving and changing so fast that we're not going to see, you know, any, any always think if somebody's telling you something like, or a tool, right, there may be a good use for it, but they just might be selling you something that you don't need later on. And just to be very wary of that. Solid so you, you heard it here first, folks, just bolt a chat agent onto everything. Yeah. Put a bird on it. <laughs> put a bird on it. Exactly. Well, Ken, thank you very much. Yeah, and I'll share my deck too. And hopefully we can include that along oh. so people can have that for reference material. Nice, appreciate that. Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much. All right, uh, any any last questions, Roger? I do not want to uh, cut you off. I, I know that you're excited about this one. No last questions. Um, again, thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. And thank you for all the, the resources and of course the, the commentary, the feedback, uh, advice. It's It's been really great. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you guys too. I'd love to get back and talk about other things too, right? Like I, we could do a heads down, like just in, you know, I thought of, I thought a lot about like if uh, folks here wanted to see more code versus the business stuff. Yes, yeah. that, that, there's that's a hard yes. So Sign up. Sign up. <laughs> well, all right, folks, have a wonderful evening and we will see you again next week. Bye, y'all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.